Welcome. Thank you all for joining our second Art and Libraries virtual program. I'm so excited to be here with my co-host, Seth Torin. Um, so just like last time, this session is being recorded and will be documented on the library's website for public perusal. We encourage your engagement and welcome questions in the chat box uh, publicly or privately or questions using your audio or video. At the end of the session, we'll post a survey to get your feedback on the session. Okay. Yep. Um, so Beth Torn and I are excited to welcome Charlotte Helke, who will be presenting Purina the Archive, Lee Greer Brewster at WVU Libraries. Dr. Helke's research interests include queer and feminist approaches to the archives, effect, queer arts and performance, and feminist and queer organizing. She teaches courses in feminist and queer theory, as well as sexuality in American culture. She is passionate about connecting her students to feminist and queer praxis, and is involved in a variety of community projects and initiatives, including a current project with Planned Parenthood Votes South Atlantic in building a menstrual equity coalition at WVU. Welcome, Professor Helke. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Sally, and to you and Beth um, and your team for inviting me and for organizing this series. Uh, it's nice to connect with people um, during this time where a lot of us are isolating at home. Um, so thank you everyone too for showing up uh, to learn more about Lee Group Brewster uh, and his connection to the WVU libraries. Uh, so uh, I moved here to West Virginia in 2017 and I've been really grateful for and impressed by the amount of feminist and queer um, grassroots organizing here. Um, and so before I start my presentation, I just wanted to ask if like anyone um, can name any folks from West Virginia uh, who have been active or who are active in um, LGBTQ organizing. So. Um, Beth uh, created this really cool poll, so if you could just click yes or no, that'd be really great. And someone other than Lee Group Rooster, don't cheat. <laughs> Give you a second. Oh, I made the, the poll disappear, Beth. I don't know if you can see it. I, I see it. Okay, cool. Do you, can you see the results of it too? Oh, there you go. Okay, so 66% said no. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping by the end of the presentation, you'll have kind of a, uh, at least know um, two or three others that I'm going to kind of talk about in this presentation. Um, so let me see. I'm just going to close this. So um, what comes to mind for me immediately when um, thinking about this question is the work of um, Ash Cutright and the folks at Morgantown Pride, which is a local organization who um, put together the first Pride event in Morgantown last spring. Uh, so my goal of the presentation is to introduce you to another West Virginia uh, connection to monumental uh, time and queer organizing in the United States, uh, Lee Group Brewster. In particular, uh, I want to link the um, organizing of Morgantown Pride within a genealogy of queer organizing specifically linking them to the organizing, organizer and entrepreneur Lee Group Brewster, who's pictured here in the crown. Um, I'll also highlight Brewster's connection to West Virginia and his representation in the West Virginia and Regional History Center archive. So uh, I became uh, aware of Brewster's work when one of my TAs in the Center for Women's and Gender Studies uh, introduced me to his activism. Uh, and I was really, really excited to hear about him because I wanted to incorporate more um, connections to West Virginia in my um, LGBTQ studies classes. Uh, so since then, um, I've located six of his magazines um, that he's edited, which I'm going to talk about later in the presentation. And I actually was really excited um, uh, prepping for this presentation. I just kind of did a Google search of his magazines. They don't come up that often. And I found another this week, so I'm super excited. I bought it um, and I'm going to donate it to the archive once it opens again. Um, so I'm also trying to research more of his life and legacy, uh, and I'm in the kind of preliminary stages of this project. Uh, so before uh, I begin, I wanted to stress that, um, oops, this is kind of a really surface level presentation. He lived a really, really rich life, um, and I'm not going to be able to detail many elements of his life or go into detail. Uh, such as his contentious relationship with lesbian feminists and uh, the changing nature of drag magazine through the years. 
And then before I begin too, I just wanted to make a note about language. So during the 60s and 70s, uh, certain languages frequently used as a source of pride in drag magazine uh, and by Libre Brewster, and we're going to see some of that in this presentation. Um, however, um, a lot of these terms aren't used, uh, or language isn't used by people anymore to describe themselves and are considered offensive slurs by many. So it's best practice to ask uh, individuals politely how they identify, or listen to what they tell you, respect what they tell you. Um, and knowing what a label means, it's only like a way to kind of um, help you understand a community. It's not meant to be prescriptive. Uh, and even if someone identifies a certain way as we know or should know, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you um, should use that to describe them. So uh, with that being said, let's get to Brewster. So Lee Greer Brewster was born in a log cabin in Honaker, uh, Virginia uh, on April 27, 1943, and he sadly passed away from cancer uh, in the year 2000. So um, after his birth, his family moved to West Virginia, and uh, his father was apparently a coal miner or connected to a coal mine in some way. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out where in West Virginia he lived, uh, but I don't have an exact location yet. Uh, in the 1960s, he apparently worked as like a file clerk or maybe in fingerprinting for the FBI, but uh, he was apparently fired for being suspected for being um, gay. So he then um, relocated to New York City. And again, I'm sorry, a lot of these details of his early life are kind of murky. Uh, I'm trying to figure out um, when he relocated. Uh, in 1967, though, we do know from Drag Magazine that he dressed um, in women's attire for the first time. It's pictured here. And he was for sure in New York City in 1969. Uh, does anyone know what like significant event happened in New York City in 1969? In terms of LGBTQ organizing, you could type it in the chat if you'd like. I think I can see the chat here. Stonewall. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Lots of people are commenting Stonewall. That's great. I'm so happy that you know about it. Um, if you don't uh, know what Stonewall, uh, the Stonewall uprising or rebellion was, on June 28th, 1969, police violently raided um, a gay bar known as the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village in New York City. And uh, the drag queens, trans women, and gay men fought back against police violence, uh, which sparked a couple days worth of protests. Um, uh, I haven't been able to confirm whether or not he was uh, participating in this rebellion, uh, but he was really active in um, uh, organizing in New York City at this time. Oops. So for instance, here is uh, Brewster speaking at a 1971 gay rights rally in New York. So um, as many of you know, to commemorate Stonewall, uh, pride marches began to be held in 1970. And Brewster did march at some of the first Pride marches in New York City. And so for me, Morgantown Pride is kind of part of this particular genealogy of queer organizing um, that uh, Brewster has direct ties to um, as it was direct tied to the atmosphere in which he was organizing in. Uh, and Brewster's work, as I'm going to talk about in a second, was really influential in LGBTQ organizing, uh, popular culture, and more. So for instance, on October 31st, 1969, Brewster founded the group, the Queen's Liberation Movement. So according to Brewster, the broad objective of the Queen Liberations, oh sorry, front rather, not movement, Queen's Liberation Front was to gain the legal right for everyone who so desires to cross-dress, uh, regardless of their sexual orientation or desires. So um, they had two goals in order to achieve this. The first was the right to congregate, and the second was uh, the right to dress as they saw fit. So um, at the time in New York, uh, for instance, when you applied for a dance permit, uh, it stated that men dressed in women's attire were not permitted on the premises. And so this essentially made um, like drag balls illegal. Um, and so Brewster and his lawyers su successfully um, uh, tackled this clause, um, fought against it, and other discriminatory measures. So for instance, according to his obituary, he assisted in persuading the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs to delete um, the term homosexuals from a list of people who could be removed from public places. Uh, this was like seldom enforced, but Brewster felt like it gave um, the police the legal authority that they uh, 
needed to harass gay folks. So he thought it was really important to tackle that. Brewster was also um, really um, passionate about reminding those in the LGBT movement at the time um, that drag queens and trans trans folks were leading uh, political and social organizing. So for instance, this is uh, Brewster and the Crown um, at a gay pride demonstration in Central Park in 1971. And his sign says, we're only number two and we do try harder. And this is referencing the fact, uh, or the, referencing that drag queens and trans women um, felt as if they were treated as second class citizens in the movement. Um, Brewster also sparred with lesbian feminists at gatherings, uh, demanding that they respect drag queens and trans folks. So um, as you can imagine, these uh, legal battles that I, I mentioned were really, really expensive. Uh, so Brewster needed to fund these. Uh, so to fund these battles, uh, legal battles, Brewster engaged in several um, business enterprises. So first, he organized a number of successful drag and costume balls. And um, so this is an advertisement for one. According to his obituary in the New York Times, Brewster organized his own balls uh, at the Old Diplomat Hotel on West 43rd Street. The balls held from 1969 to 1973 became so popular that uh, Jacqueline Susan, Carol Channing, and Shirley MacLaine actually attended the last one. So here's some images from those balls, or one of those balls in 1972. And this was, I believe, in Drag Magazine, I think. It might have been from one of the programs. So um, keeping with this theme of Mardi Gras, in 1971, um, Brewster opened Lee's Mardi Gras Boutique. And this uh, began as like a mail order shop, but it, uh, at one point it was a 5,000 square foot loft filled to the rafters with transformation essentials. Um, so this is, includes books related to trans issues, drag queens uh, issues, rights, um, topics and organizing, um, boas, heels, dresses, makeup, um, etc. So Brewster would also give out um, makeovers there. So I found a story online from someone claiming to have been a patron of the store who commented that Brewster gave them a makeover for free and acted as a mentor to them. Uh, with this store, Brewster was also um, concerned about privacy. And so although the store um, changed sites several times, uh, he always had it at like a walk-up location so to protect people's privacy and give like a kind of discreet location for people to come visit. So I found a quote from Brewster um, reflecting on the store where he said that it's been an exciting, educational, and sometimes exasperating 30 years in business. We've been there from the start, servicing the quiet, lonely crossdresser in middle America to Broadway, television, and movie production staffs at Tootsie, um, Priscilla, LeCage, and everyone's favorite talk show. The opening sequence of Tu Wong Fu looks like a commercial for Mardi Gras Boutique. So many of the items changing the stars into ladies having been purchased there. Nathan Lane, star of the crossdressing hit the birdcage, filmed the promo for the movie at our store. So Brewster's stores are for connected to some really significant pieces of um, popular culture. So in um, 1971, Brewster founded and edited the first volume of Drag Queen magazine, and they soon changed the name to um, Drag Magazine uh, thereafter. Uh, so here's some covers of the magazine, and the illustrations are by Vicki West. So he published these magazines well into the 1980s. And as we can see uh, in this advertisement um, for the magazine, they were mailed in like a plain brown envelope to kind of be discreet and respect people's privacy. Um, these magazines were uh, not only educational, they were like a community building resource in my view uh, for drag queens and trans folks. Um, as you can see from this advertisement, the magazines had articles uh, with titles such as Hormones Do Make a Difference, Drag Queens Demonstrate, Wow, I'm Prettier Than My Sister, First Time in Drag, and more. They also featured um, news articles, like news updates. So here's one uh, such feature. Um, editorials, calls to action. Here's one from Drag Magazine um, reminding people of Gay Pride Week. 
Uh, and it says uh, quite um, prominently, Queen's Liberation Front reminds you that, drag, that the drag queen founded the gay pride movement. March with us and show the world you're proud. Also featured personal ads, um, events, and um, miscellaneous pictures. So uh, I want to direct your attention to the top left corner. There's Marsha P. Johnson, who uh, many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and the magazine also featured advertisements. So um, here's one for a salon, for instance, that says, come in or out of drag. From these advertisements, um, we also get a sense of um, the many uh, businesses that uh, Brewster was involved in. It's almost dizzying the amount of uh, ventures he was in. So for instance, um, uh, Brewster acted as a drag consultant. Uh, I, well, I think based on this ad, because it's d demonstrating or it's um, picturing Brewster. So here's Brewster before and after. It says, make your boy self into your girl self. Drag consultants, private, discreet, and reasonable. Brewster was also, um, ran a public speaking service. So here's Brewster in the top left corner, um, speaking to New York uh, University. Uh, I also want to bring your attention to um, the, the different uh, diverse ways in which the panelists are all identifying. He also ran a gay travel service, or acted as a gay travel agent. And this wasn't in Drag Magazine, but I had to include it anyway. He ran um, a publication service, Queen's Publications. This was in um, one of his ball pro uh, programs, Drag Ball programs. So in summary, um, Brewster was a significant uh, organizer um, in 1960s and 1980s, uh, LGBTQ organizing, um, fighting to remove discriminatory legal measures against LGBTQ folks, um, demanding respect and inclusion of drag queens, gender nonconforming folks, and trans folks in the gay liberation movements. He's also significant in creating safer spaces for people to explore and embody their gender uh, and femininity through his drag balls magazine and store. He did all of this um, after having to leave West Virginia, reportedly with $100 in his pocket. Modern LGBTQ uh, organizers like Morgan Tide Pride um, consciously or unconsciously are linked to Brewster's organizing um, in a genealogy of kind of queer organizing um, in the United States and beyond. Brewster's organizing and efforts, as well as the efforts of uh, an organizing of other prominent uh, and, and grassroots, not maybe uh, as well-known organizers, um, like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, um, uh, it's documented in this magazine. So this kind of leads us to Brewster's representation um, in our archives. Um, the West Virginia Regional History Center now owns at least six um, copies of Drag Magazine. And to me, these magazines are, like I said, invaluable time capsules uh, of a significant moment in queer organizing as they contextualize contemporary queer organizing uh, in West Virginia by folks like Morgantown Pride and Queer Appalachia. And I, I'm really grateful for um, Jane LaBarbera, uh, Lori Hostetler, Stuart Klein, and the rest of the West Virginia Regional History Center team for order, ordering these materials and making them available to the public. Um, I'm also really grateful for Sally, um, who organized uh, it so that uh, we could display an exhibition on Brewster in the WVU libraries for LGBTQ History Month last October. Um, to me, the inclusion of Brewster in the archive acts as like a querying of the archive um, because it gestures to a long history of West Virginians, or at least those connected to West Virginia, being active in queer organizing and community building. His inclusion in the archive also disrupts any theological fallacies that present queer organizing and community building of West Virginians or those connected to West Virginia as only being a recent phenomena. To me, it also um, maybe like queers the notion of like what belongs in like a West Virginian archive itself. Um, 
is Brewster, West Virginian, uh, having been raised here and leaving perhaps to, to um, anti-LGBT uh, sentiments in West Virginia, uh, did he even identify as being West Virginian? Um, these are some questions that I'm interested in exploring as I um, research more into Brewster's life and legacy. So um, while the archive here is now closed through the pandemic uh, at the moment, you can find some copies of um, Drag Magazine online through the Transgender Oral History Project. Um, so if you have any additional information on Brewster, or if you ever come across any drag magazines for sale, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, so thank you so much for your time, um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, uh, there is already a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I see it, but from Karen, right? Do you know if Brewster commented on or talked much about his West Virginia roots while in New York City? Uh, is he recognized by LGBTQ activists in West Virginia today? Um, so in terms of the first question, did he comment or talk much about his West Virginia roots? I haven't found any evidence of it yet, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So it's definitely something I'd like to look into more. Um, in terms of is he recognized by LGBTQ activists in West Virginia today? Not so much that I know of, but um, I, I don't know if many people know about his West Virginia connection or even know about him. Uh, like I said, when I came here, um, it was one of my students that uh, messaged me. It was like, did you know, like I, I looked in this, did you know they had a West Virginia connection? Um, and so I'm really grateful, like I said, to the library for um, purchasing his materials, for highlighting him through things like this lecture, um, and in the uh, exhibition that Sally organized um, so that more people can kind of um, learn about him and, and learn, contextualize, I guess, our organizing here in West Virginia. Yes, thank you. Anyone else have questions or want to share their famous um, LGBTQ individual that's from or spent time in West Virginia? Something exciting they learned today? I know I want to know what happened to the costumes. Do you know <laughs> for their, their dresses? <laughs> I, so I don't, I know that um, he donated um, papers to an archive that I, in New York City, that I don't know if it exists anymore. I, I'm having a hard time like locating it. Mm -hmm. I'm blanking on the name of it right now. Um, but yeah, that's something I'd like to look into because yes, they, they are amazing. <laughs> and then the artist you mentioned that drew the covers is, um, is what, do you know anything about that person? Not a lot. I just, it's, it's like putting together a big puzzle because there's kind of these little, um, no one's done like I think a, a significant like piece or book or anything on Brewster. And so it's kind of like putting all these things together with the magazine. And so I did find a brief bio on Vicki West um, and uh, I, I can send it to you after or I can include it later um, if you want to email folks the slides. Yeah, yeah. And do you have them in PDF? Oh, shoot. Yeah, I, I can make them in PDF. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. No rush. I can email them or you can upload them into the, the chat box. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, oh, I see yeah. there's another comment. I was surprised that we, Jessica says, I was surprised that we couldn't find any more about his West Virginia roots. Uh, I'll have to try to research him again. Yeah, no, same. Um, uh, there's not a lot. And what th there is out there, sometimes it's kind of conflicting. So there was one story about his father being a coal miner and then another one said no 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 it was a repair person uh in but working at the coal mines so and then Cheyenne says I think Brewster could have possibly influenced prior movements after it's just due to how kept them yes and tried to rally yeah exactly yeah you got it Cheyenne that's that's I feel the same and um thank you for bringing those to the archives and uh, Stuart doesn't have her her audio or video working, but I'm wondering how much else is in the archive in terms of LGBTQ archives. Maybe you know, or other people know? I know Beth just told me about um, the, uh, Beth, you can jump in. I'm gonna mess it up. The WBU Homophile Association, copy of their constitution or something. Oh, Beth might be muted. Oh yeah, Beth, you're muted. <laughs> I was holding my space bar and it's, um, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, you got it. It's the Homophile Association and um, we have their, their kind of constitution and um, much like that one um, 
slide you showed, it, the main things were kind of basic human rights, like we want to be able to congregate and not be yeah, persecuted. Yeah. No, I'm really excited to take a look at that once the uh, distancing measures aren't in place anymore. We can get back in the archive. Yes, I think there was another question. Um, do we have his father's name? Actually, I've been trying to figure this out for months, and I just found who I think is his father and his brother. And so, Stuart, I was literally going to email you today and go, guess what? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to email you afterwards. But I think so. Um, I, we, I went to the archive, and um, uh, Jane LaBarba was trying to help me kind of search through public records to find... Um, uh, him and where he lived and we didn't have much luck, but I, I think I might have tracked it down So I'm definitely going to email you after and see what you think about this feed Oh, and then Stuart says to um, that there's a um, oh, gosh, Not let me scroll down. Give me a second here. Just jumping up because of more people commenting. Yeah, there's a new um, LGBTQ collection donated by Ed Sebesta um, that's really, really amazing, and it covers materials from the early 1970s. I know that there's, um, like, first editions of the Journal of Homosexuality and, like, primary documents from um, LGBTQ organizing in San Francisco in the 1970s. It's really amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Do you find... Oh, there's a question. Are any other activist organizers from West Virginia that were contemporary to Brewster? So do you mean like after Brewster, Jacob? Around the same time or after? Um, so not so much. Like, I, I guess just what Beth said about the, the Homophile Association would have been around that time, probably just before. Um, and then there's so much going on today. Um, I couldn't list all the organizing that's happening. Um, oh, did you mention that you're conducting an oral history project connected to this collection? I'm hoping to, this is, yeah, it's been one of these things where, um, I, uh, I just found that, I think the magazines we got in the fall, I want to say, and then it's just been such a busy spring semester, especially with this whole change to online. Um, but yeah, I'd like to do the, an oral history project, um, collecting people's stories. Uh, I, I feel kind of, um, bad because I, I was holding off a bit and um, one of his business partners um, I found out just recently passed away and so that's like a whole library of stories right um, that isn't here anymore um, so it kind of gave me a good kick in the butt to um, start that and look more into the group rooster is there any more questions that I missed or anything like that um Thank you, everyone. Thanks, yeah, um, I'm going to post a link to this survey right now. If you can fill it out, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to remind everyone we have our email newsletter. If you want to sign up, you can put your email on the newsletter. And yeah, this was a really great presentation. Thank you so much, um, oh, Charlotte. Thanks. And our next session will be um, let's see, June 5th with pathology program assistant Beth Ann McCormick. She works in the Health Sciences Center, but she is also an artist in glasswork, uh, fabric work, ceramics, and more. So she'll be talking about that. And June 26th, we have artist and poet Carrie Gunter Seymour. And I'm exploring ideas for July, maybe doing a round robin art and craft presentation. Feel free to send me ideas. And I think that is all. So thank you so much, everyone, and especially Charlotte and Beth. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. This is really great. Yeah. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks Bye. again.